and now we're picking up uh, <clears throat> a uh, game eight of the uh, candidates semifinal match uh, between uh, uh, Mikhail Tal and Ben Larson, which took place in 1965. So far, after six games, the, uh, it was tied up at two apiece. Um, you know, players going back and forth. Tal uh, winning the game, then Larson, and Larson would win, and Tal would win, and uh, Tal won in game six in devastating um, sacrificial uh, fashion. And in game seven, Tal had the black pieces, and after 51 moves came to this position where he had the uh, Rook and Knight in Pawn versus King Knight, in, uh, Rook, excuse me, King, Rook, and Pawn versus King, Knight, and Pawn. And, um, this position, amazingly enough, if you throw it into the Nalamov table base, uh, is a, a draw. Um, and of course, if you take the the pawns off, you probably uh, still have a draw. I mean, the basic, um, and it's white to move here, by the way. Of course, if it was black's move, then black would just take the knight. But um, Tao uh, tried his hardest to win this game, uh, even sacrificing the pawn. I mean, the basic idea, of, I've explained this in uh, other videos of the rook, king and rook versus um, king and knight in game, is for the defending side, the defending side must keep the knight and king together as close as possible. Once there's distance, then it's possible for the player, the stronger side, to win. Um, you know, because the, the pieces are far apart. And um, by creating mating threats and such, <clears throat> often you can, uh, you know, corner the king and wind up uh, winning uh, the knight or trapping the knight off, basically. So just remember just to stick together. If you have that type of ending, keep your knight and king as close as possible uh, at all times to defend. So, with that in mind, Larson played knight e4. I'll just go through these moves quick. But notice how he's just basically keeping the king and knight as close as he can to each other. Just kind of moving back, shuffling back and forth. And Tal is trying to work it out where he can... You know, get him separated, but Larson obviously knows the defense. And we see, you know, Tao didn't just overlook a pawn here, but what he did is he sacrificed the pawn in order to gain some separation here. So this is kind of his, like, last attempt to try to win the game. So he has him separated, but that extra pawn gives, um, you know, white just enough to keep... Um, black at bay. He has to um, now. If it was a situation where that pawn was off the board, this would be enough for Black to win. But Larson has this G pawn, and so he's able to keep um, Tao, you know, honest to where he can't really, you know, go after the king like he would wish. See, and here at this point, once he goes, um, once Tao, the game was agreed. Agree drawing here by the way. So for example, once Tau played Rook takes G7, King C2 would get played just, you know, by an example. And say for instance, King E4, right? Or even like, I don't know, Rook G5, you know, one of these type of moves. Then the knight would just be able to come right back. And then you would be in that same situation where the knight and the king are just close together again. So, good effort by Tao trying to win it. Because um, that would have basically won the candidates match for him. Um, Larson would have needed a win in the last game. And um, good defense by uh, Larson. And that game started off as a Benoni Fianchetto system, by the way. Alright. So... With that said, we come to game eight. All um, tied up here. And we see similar situation. This time, a Sicilian defense was played. So uh, Larson, after losing with his uh, Alcon defense, opted for a Sicilian against Tao. And, uh, you know, he did pretty good, and he just basically was able to hold on, trade off some pieces. He was under some slight pressure from Tao, but in the end, he was uh, 
able to draw this game eight also. In game nine, we saw Larson again with the white pieces, opting for the Sphere and Kettle setup against um, this English. Actually, it's a symmetrical English, but notice how Tal is pretty much sticking to the same structure. He's been playing the Benoni, so this fits right in, and this gives you a little insight on building your repertoire. You know, play play openings that you know that are that are interrelated. So that if uh, you play Benoni. And then somebody plays the English. Okay, you can play symmetrical English with C5. You don't have to change your repertoire. That way you're familiar with the structures. Okay. And again, at the hard forward game, there's still a draw in place. So this leads us uh, to game 10. Interesting enough, in this position, F6 probably gives Black a nice advantage here. Say like after F4, uh, Rook takes E7. F takes, uh, D takes. That seems like Black is the one uh, with the with the better chances here. But needless to say, Game Nine was also drawn. So we go into this final Game Ten with both players tied up. So um, you know, whoever wins is going to um, go on uh, to face um, Boris Spassky. At this time, by the way, um, Tigrin Petrosian is the world champion. So, in the other candidate semifinal, uh, Boris Baski is uh, waiting. So, whoever wins this game is going to play uh, Boris Baski in the, in the candidates uh, final. So, here we are. Tau, E4, C5. Again, Larson, after losing in Alicon's defense, uh, he drew one game and lost the second game. He switched over to the Sicilian defense. Okay. So here we have this kind of uh, Skyfenegan variation. Or Shavenegan, as Americans would say. So F4. Bishop E7. Queen F3. This is all standard. Tal is going for the juggler. Going to castle queen side. And we're going to have this all out battle. Anand played the move several times in this position. A6 here versus Ivanchuk. But he also played bishop E7 here also. And it's funny because he, he lost the game. Not in this exact position but a similar position. The difference in that position was this bishop was on G5. And then F uh, F4 was played. Here, slightly different position. So f4, bishop e7, queen f3, castles, castles, queen side, queen c7, knight b5, queen b8. Got to keep an eye on the d pawn, right? So g4. So let the games begin. So this move is not again super serious at this point because white, uh, black has not been provoked into playing the move h6. It has more bite when black has played h6 already. Um, furthermore, notice how the d7 square is kept clear, clear so that upon g, uh, you know, when white plays g5, the knight can just skate back to d7. All right. Uh, this is keeping them with Steiner's principle that you don't want to create any weaknesses in your position, you know, unless absolutely necessary, especially around your king side. You know, um, a lot of players on instinct will try to play a move like g6 or h6, figuring that they're you know, stopping something, but in reality, they're just giving the opponent more um, targets. A6, Larson gets his queenside counterplay on, as we do in the Sicilian. Knight takes d5, excuse me, d4, bishop takes d4. b4, so um, a couple of minor pieces are traded off. The c file is open, and white gets, black gets his queenside play underway. G5, no big deal. Knight D7, Larson comes back. And now Bishop D3. B4. And huh, here we go again. Right? What do you play in this position? I mean, normal, and I say normal, I mean, people from this planet play moves like Knight A4 or uh, Knight E2. But if you're not from this planet, right? If you come from Riga, in uh, Riga, Latvia, you know, you're from a different world. You play moves like, you know, Knight D5, like Alexei Sherov. You know, these type of, these, you know, there's something about that. There's something in the water. These players, you know, um, highly combative. 
And just think of the psychological effect this type of move must have had on Larson. Here we are in the last game of the candidate final. It's winner take all. And Tao is still not afraid to sacrifice a piece. Like he's just like it's just like a regular game. And he's just looking at the general aspects of the position. The general aspects of the position say basically if E takes uh, D5, E takes D5, and both of my bishops are facing toward the G7, H7 square. I got the H5 square, and I'll have some general attacking chances on the uh, king side, a la Lasker versus Bauer with those two powerful bishops. Okay, it's like real general. I doubt that. Um... So, let's go. So, of course, Larson accepted the sacrifice. E takes D5. E takes D5. And now, F5 is played by Larson. So, he wants to shut down the any, any type of attack here from Black. Black just simply plays Rook D, E1, attacking the bishop. Rook F7. H4. Bishop B7. And now Bishop takes F5, of course, exploiting the fact that the Rook on F5. The Rook takes F5 will lead to Rook takes E7. So Rook takes F5, he does it anyway. Rook takes E7. And this gives uh, some chances here to Tao. Um, this, um, entering to these complications. Knight E5. If bishop, <clears throat> if bishop takes uh, d5 here, then there's a spectacular, uh, <laughs> you know, refutation, and just simply rook takes g7. King f8, and then say queen g4. So this is why the bishop. The bishop gets cut off here. You know, bishop and rook coordination against g7 by knight e5. And of course, the idea is <laughs> that f takes e5 is not going to happen because the rook is here. So queen e4, attacking the um, rook on f5, maintaining initiative, queen f5, queen f8, excuse me. f takes e5. So Tao has got, gotten his piece back. Queen e3. Rook f3, queen e2, queen takes e7, queen takes f3, d takes, rook e1, rook d8, rook takes e5, and now it's Tau who is up uh, two pawns here. Queen d6, and now queen f4 threatening this discovery check. Mean rook e8 check, rook f8, queen e4, b3, a takes b3. Rook f1, king d2, queen b4, and this is like the last gasp efforts from Larson. Queen d6, bishop c5, queen takes c5, another sacrifice from Tau, rook e8, rook f8, queen e6, king h8, and then queen f7, just brutalizing um, Larson and closing the lid in spectacular uh, fashion. A wonderful match, like I said, I recommend... You know, the study of that match. Um, like I said, I just did like a preliminary study, light cursory study with some brief comments. But um, just just the contrast and styles. Um, you know, both players. What I liked about Larson is he wasn't, he lost a match. You know, anybody could lose. But what I liked about the match is Larson wasn't afraid to enter into complications with Tao. He played the Sicilian against Tao, for goodness sake. Alakon's defense. Right, all fight, fighting defenses. He he didn't he didn't see Carol Khan, you didn't see Petrov. Uh, you know, he just went he he went for it, and of course, at the end of the day, he lost he lost this match, but he he wasn't afraid to um to mix it up, and this led for some uh exciting exciting chess. Um, but this move right here, um, this move that Tao made. This knight d5 here was just, and move 16 was just uh, incredible. Um, 
course you look at it with the you know the engines and everything was it completely sound it's hard to say you know maybe not because you know i'm sure this game's been studied a lot but you know just basically keeping the position closed um for instance g6 um it's hard to see what white can come up with here fast enough of course white has ideas like for instance h4 h5 and you know busting up a position but is it fast enough because black has moves too so you do rook h1 you know um like for instance rook h1 hitting this guy bishop d d8 queen h3 idea of course queen h6 mate but you still got this counter move you see what i'm saying black has chances too queen h6 and then you start trading do moves like this this should be six right and you know the old Steiner's principle you you just give up you know don't be afraid to give back uh material right? and there's some venom here if f takes e5 then just bishop takes d4 right bishop takes here then you simply play knight takes d3 check Right, rook takes and this simplification definitely is going to favor a uh, white so um it was tau sacrifice sound probably not you know after g6 it seems like that shuts the door f5 was probably a little too uh optimistic for larson right but that was his style he played you know he played like that um but again you know you have to incorporate all the human elements all the pressure that was on these players right here and again like i said a normal situation normal player from this earth you know uh you know a kramnik uh, you know Laco, you know a non you know you know just players would have you know karpov would have played these moves with which would have probably been you know technically correct but then the game would have just probably ended in the draw or whatever you know after e you know for instance 92 e5 but with all the pressure tau just played this move where he probably didn't see everything but just general he saw like some general chances in the position and he just you know like the poker turn he just went all in so um you know i hope you enjoy that you know and again i have other series um you know a non ivan chuck I went over that match that took place in 91 um uh 92 i'm sorry went over the anon drev match we we did tau portish and we're gonna keep doing them you know the candidates because um you know these these matches are great matches and often get f uh, forgotten about and they helped me a lot in my chest just studying them and looking over looking over the matches and um we're gonna be doing some more so i hope you enjoyed this one please comment like subscribe all that good stuff um if you you have you know some extra chains please donate because we know chess lessons can cost a lot of money and all of this stuff is um free you know so you, you know if you feel like doing so you know just um you know please um donate in the link down below so we're gonna um look at some other candidates matches and um we'll see you on the next video